So to really understand what we're talking about here, you have to understand a little bit of science. And what I mean by that is the distinction that's up here between whole blood, plasma blood, and serum blood. It is visually different. Over here is whole blood. That means what basically what came out of your arm, what got into the tube. Two other types of blood are plasma blood and serum blood. This is what they're doing a testing of over in the lab for hospital blood testing. They're visually different. Serum blood testing has a clot that's right there with the separation on the top. You can read what the components are as far as the difference between plasma and serum. But the most important thing to recognize is, like Sesame Street folks, one of these things is not like the other one of these things. This is whole blood, visually different from plasma, visually different from serum blood. Okay, now, I'm going to tell you that when they make the conversion between plasma and serum blood back into whole blood, because whole blood is what statutes are based upon. If you're a .08 state, which all states are, my state has different tiers, 08, 0 .10, 0 .16, that conversion back between plasma blood and serum blood if you believe it's possible to do, results in somewhere in the magnitude of a 49% overstatement. So that means what comes out of their machine at the end of their process is about 59% too much. Yes? You said 49%. 59%, yeah, thank you. 59% overstated, and I'm going to show you why. And that's because you're not testing the whole blood. You're removing things out of it. and so. What is important is for you to know how the process so you can recognize when it's not a whole blood test. Because whole blood is what a conviction is based upon, meaning grams per deciliter inside as an expression of weight, a volumetric weight of whole blood as opposed to serum or plasma. If you have a plasma result or you have a, a, um, a serum result, it, should, it shouldn't be reported in court as a whole blood result, but they do it all the time, and I'll show you how they do that. So this is what happens with the lab scientist. The lab scientist gets a nice, pretty, gray tube top. This is a pipetter. This is a solution, and the solution has an acronym that's called TCA. TCA is trichloroacetic acid. Okay? What that is designed to do is a, it's called a deprotonizing agent. Inside of our blood, we have proteins. And what needs to be removed in order for these types of machines to work is the proteins because it interferes with getting a result at the end of the day. So what ends up happening is they take the pipette from your nice, beautiful, what they do is they take the pipette, they load it up with TCA, and then they put it in the blood tube. That's the first step that's there. What they do after that, having difficulty with the pointer, apologize, is they take that, they bring it over to what's called a vortexer. What a vortexer does is it mixes up the TCA that's inside of there. And so what that does is it takes the TCA, and it's just like oil and water, and mixes it up so it's, it's homologous, meaning that it's all homogenous, rather. It's all the same type of thing that's mixed in there. What ends up happening is it forms a pellet at the bottom because you're removing the protein. The protein binds because of TCA. It goes down to the bottom. You can see a pellet. What happens next is they take it over to a device that's called a centrifuge. It goes over to the centrifuge. And the important thing to know about the centrifuge is that once it goes in there, they load up a bunch of samples all at the same time and they spin it at a 45 degree angle. Uh, anyone ever seen the movie Spies Like Us? Okay, remember that scene where they go in the centrifuge and the guy's faces all get smushed back and everything like that? That's a centrifuge. It's the same thing that happens here. Through the force that goes on when it spins around, what ends up happening is the lighter stuff goes to the top, the heavier stuff 
goes to the bottom. Pretty simple. It creates a visible, very visible, distinguishable separation that's there. So this is what it looks like when it spins in there. There are variables that go in there. If you don't spin it the right way, then it's no good. Okay. Now, the whole point of it is, is after it comes out of the centrifuge, you can see this separation that's there between the yellow viscous material, the plasma at the top, and at the bottom, you can see what's out there. So again, what ends up happening is it turns into that distinction between the red blood cells, the heavier stuff's at the bottom, the lighter stuff's at the top. I bring this all to you so you can understand this most next fundamental important step. This is the most important step and this is how you're going to get them and you're going to show in this process how it's not a whole blood result. And it is the single biggest way that I know how to win these types of cases if all you have to do is show that it's not a whole blood result and they don't have someone in court who's willing to come in and testify scientifically as to their conversion rate because it's not whole blood. And it comes down to this nice little dirty secret. So we have it centrifuged, it's separated, and what they do is they take the pipette and they draw up just, and it's called aspirating the supernate. So if you're reading through your SOPs of the hospitals, the standard operating procedures of the hospitals, if you see the word supernate, you won. I mean, you don't have to know anything else. Just look for that word supernate, okay? You aspirate, which means you draw up the supernate, which is only this yellow component. You don't care about the rest. Then what you do after that, come on, be my friend. It goes over there into your specimen jar, and then you take the rest of it, because you're only taking the yellow viscous material and not all of it, just a very small portion of it, about that much into there, you take the rest of it and you throw it away. That's what they do in these labs, is they take the rest of the stuff, meaning the red blood cells, meaning the fibrin, meaning the proteins, and they throw that away that never makes it over to the analyzer, and in your pipette is only that yellow viscous material. So they take it over to an analyzer. This is a day dimension RXL max, uh, highly complicated machine. At least it looks that way. But the most important thing to know is that it is only testing through that reagent process, which we'll go over in a minute, the yellow viscous material that's contained inside there. And so what ends up happening is, and this is an important distinction right here, is it goes in there. The only thing that makes it to the machine out of all of the blood, out of your entire whole blood, is that yellow part, the plasma part. So it's not a test on whole blood. It is a test on the yellow part or the supernate. That's the most important thing to take away from here. But as we will see, there's a big difference that happens here between what happens in the clinical world and the forensic world. This is, a, this is an interface that's called the laboratory information system. The laboratory information system is a computer. What ends up happening is this machine itself prints out these little tickets, um, kind of like a BAC data master or, or an etoxalyzer or something like that. But the laboratory information system is an external thing that doesn't integrate with it. That's, someone sits there and puts in the hand input, not connected to the machine, and reports the particular result. But, that's what ends up happening is they only test the yellow part of it and it's most distinctly, as you can see, it's not whole blood. It's not whole blood. 